Welcome to Take the Cannoli, the definitive podcast for fans of The Godfather. You give us 22 minutes, we'll give you everything you ever wanted to know about The Godfather movies, the characters, the quotes, and why we're still talking about this stuff 50 years later. Now here's your host, Godfatherologist, Lou Bortone. Hey, it's Lou Bortone. Welcome to Take the Cannoli, the Godfather podcast. And we are going to talk about everything Godfather on this podcast. We'll talk about the impact on the culture, why we're still talking about these movies 50 years later. I'll even throw in some of my own background and why I'm so obsessed with The Godfather. It may have started with my old father. I still have his copy here of the original Godfather novel from 1969. And I remember seeing The Godfather in a drive-in movie theater in Medford, Mass, the Wellington Circle drive-in back when drive-ins were a thing. And what they would do is they would show two movies. They'd show sort of a family-friendly movie first, and then they'd show sort of an adult feature later on. I think the assumption was, well, thanks for chiming in there, Rocco and Regina. You'll hear them from time to time. The assumption was, okay, we'll show the kiddie movie first, and then the kiddies will fall asleep in the back seat, and then we'll show them more grown-up feature. So that was the case back in 1970, spring of 1970, I believe, is when it came out. Yep, it came out on my birthday, March 4th, 70. So I would have been pretty young. In any event, they showed like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang with Dick Van Dyke for the first feature. And then I was kind of a night person. I didn't fall asleep for the second feature like kids are supposed to. So I was kind of peering up from the back seat of the family station where I can say, what? the hell is this? And for me, seeing The Godfather for the first time was an epiphany because I grew up in a very Italian neighborhood. I grew up in what I consider to be the epicenter of the mafia universe, in New England at least, which was Medford, Mass. And all the wise guys lived in North Medford where I lived. I went to school with them. I played baseball with their kids. I hung out with them. And it was just sort of normal because there were just so damn many guys like that in Medford, Mass. So when I'm watching The Godfather, I'm like, oh my God, I know this is set in the past, but I know these people. These people are so familiar. They're making a movie about us, about guys from the neighborhood, which was crazy. So I think that's when my Godfather obsession began. And in the 50 years since then, I have read the book at least once a year. This is my dad's copy, as I mentioned. I have seen the movies probably three or four times a year. So that's a lot in 50 years. I remember when I worked in Los Angeles, I was a little bit intimidated because I was a, a TV radio guy going to, you know, big, scary LA to be in the business. And one of the first things I did, and this was 25 years ago, was I watched the 25th anniversary of The Godfather, re-released and remastered on the 25th anniversary at Man's Chinese Theater. Huge screen, amazing place to see a movie, unbelievable picture and sound. And that just sort of, again, reinforced that this movie is not just a movie. It is a cultural phenomenon. It is a way of life. It is history. It is culture. It is business. And I've always said that this book is a business book. And that's some of the stuff we'll be talking about here. So why do a Godfather podcast? This is certainly not the first or only Godfather podcast. Sometimes I listen to one called The Godfather Minute, where these two guys take each minute of each film and, and dissect it, which is pretty cool. So we'll do a, a little of that, but really going to focus more on the big picture of The Godfather, the business lessons, the management secrets, the ins and outs, the characters. So we're going to go deep. We're going to go well into all this cool Godfather stuff. And I'll tell you not only about my experience with it, but we'll have guests on from time to time. We'll talk about their experience with the trilogy. And again, I just watched the movies. They show them on the AMC cable network all the time. So I've been picking up bits and pieces again. I recently, and I love doing this, I had a friend who is, was not born in America and she was born in Latvia. She lives in Italy now, ironically, and she wanted to see The Godfather because she had never seen it before. So of course I 
found it and, you know, shoot it up. And it was kind of cool. And I'll tell you later on about her reactions to seeing the Godfather for the first time. So there's so much to unpack. We're going to do this once a week because there is, again, tons and tons of stuff to go into here. And not only the quotes, but just everything about the Godfather effect. Smithsonian Magazine actually calls it the Godfather effect. And there's a book by the same title, which I'm reviewing as well. And I'll share some of that with you too. But it's really more about the incredible impact that this film, one of the three films in the novel have had over the last 50 years. One of the things that's really interesting is not just the staying power, but just the fact that it's so much become part of the culture. And some people will quote the movie and not even realize they're quoting a movie. One of the things about the impact of The Godfather was that it's, they're still talking about it. We're still talking about it 50 years later. They're still making specials about it. This year was the 50th anniversary of the first film. So you may have seen that Paramount Plus Paramount owns the rights to Godfather Day. They did a mini series called The Offer, which was about the making of The Godfather. And it was a little cheesy at first, but I kind of got into it. I think it was like eight or 10 episodes, all about the making of The Godfather. It was called The Offer. It talks a lot about Robert Evans, who was running the studio at that point. Buddy, who was the producer of the movie, played by, who is that guy? Oh, shoot. Miles Teller. Yeah. And it was pretty good once you got into it. And it really talked about the making of the movie, which in itself could be a movie because it was so wrought with drama and, and just problems all the time. It's an absolute miracle that that film ever got made and finished. Francis Ford Coppola was basically in danger of being fired for half the movie. One of the studio hated Al Pacino. They, they were going to kick him out of the movie before it was too late until that scene with Salazzo and the police officer McCluskey. In the diner, that was when he finally cemented. They, they said, okay, I think you can pull this off. Casting was a huge drama. So it was just, even just the making of the film in itself was pretty amazing. So if you have an opportunity to see that mini series called The Offer, that'll give you some feedback and sort of behind the scenes of what went into making that movie. And of course, one of the main themes of that movie was how the mafia and Italian Americans in general didn't want it made because they thought it would portray them in a bad light, which I think is kind of just the opposite of what happened. I mean, really, it was the first time that Italian Americans were not stereotyped and, and Francis Ford Coppola wanted to make sure that when they made the movie, that they didn't fall into those stereotypes, you know, about, hey, this is the guy and that the guy and, and all the sort of kind of that kind of stuff. So the Coppola did really want to have mostly Italian American actors and actresses in the film, which by and large they got, they had some actual mobsters, people who had been involved, Carlo, Johnny Russo, I think his name is, who played Carlo was, had some loose ties. The actor who played Luca Brazzi certainly had some ties to the mob, but in any event, it was very, very authentic. And it was really the first time that Italian Americans had been shown in that light. And again, not just the mafia stuff, but the actual details of family and the dinners and the interactions and the mannerisms. So it was pretty brilliant in that regard as well. And I think that's one of the reasons why it had such an impact on me at a very young age, having grown up in, you know, the mob capital of New England, Medford, Mass, where, you know, guys going away was not an unusual thing at all. The guy across the street from me, I won't mention his name, but one day he just didn't come home from work and that was that. He never came back. Apparently, I asked my parents what happened to the guy across the street and they said he moved to Florida. So eventually I realized that moved to Florida was just code for he, he ratted somebody out and got whacked. So I grew up with the Angelos, the Patriarchs were in Rhode Island, but they were always involved as well. One of the interesting things about Medford is that it is in North Medford on a house, in a house, a basement down the street from where I lived, they, the FBI recorded the first and only mafia induction ceremony. It's the only time the FBI ever got one of these on tape and it happened in Medford, Mass, right down the street from me. So it was just, you know, it was kind of just a constant thing that was just around and nobody thought too much of it. I also remember my mom used to take us to a restaurant in Medford Square called the Shooter Pot. 
um, which was just a little, I don't know, cafe pub thingy. And at one point she stops taking us there and we're like, what's up with, you know, why can't we go to the pewter pot? And what I found out was that she wouldn't take us there because a guy, a mobster named Al Notarin Jelly was whacked there in broad daylight in a restaurant, which didn't happen that often. And she didn't want to take us someplace where there was, you know, somebody got whacked in broad daylight by somebody from the Angelo crew. So it was constantly around. It was just kind of one of those things that you took for granted. And uh, it certainly shaped my view of the Godfather for sure. So we're going to be talking about all kinds of cool stuff from both Mario Puzo's novel in 1969, and of course, the trilogy, first movie in 1970, and Godfather II in 1972. And I look forward to talking about that stuff with you. If you have something to say or add or your perspective about the films, I'd love to hear it. We're going to open this up to questions and calls and guests. And uh, we're just going to have an interesting, fun time talking everything Godfather. I look forward to having you join us every week. Some of the episodes, I don't think they'll ever be longer than 20 minutes. That's what I'm shooting for. If we have a guest on it, maybe a little bit more than that. But hey, this is for you too. Anyone who loves the Godfather, the movies, the trilogy, the tradition, you're welcome to join us as we do this video podcast every week for as long as we want. All about all things Godfather. We're calling it Take the Cannoli from the infamous line, Leave the Gun, Take the Cannoli, which actor Richard Castanel, what's his name? Castanel, I can't pronounce his last name. I really should be able to. Castellano. Anyway, the actor that played Pete Clemenza apparently ad-libbed that line. And, you know, maybe the most famous line in the movie other than, I'm going to make him an off they can't refuse. So we're going to dig deep into everything from the making of to the impact on culture to what I talk about most that I have a keynote about called loyalty is the new currency. So we'll be talking a lot about loyalty and about how you can use the ideas, not just for the Godfather, but all the way back to the Mafia Code in Naples and Sicily to be better at business, to build brand loyalty, to build customer loyalty. And it all makes sense as we unpack it. So I hope you can join us each week, wherever you listen to podcasts. And I look forward to hearing your perspective. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to Take the Cannoli, the Godfather podcast with Lou Bortone. Join us again next time. If you know what's good for you, the base.